Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah. It's like you haven't seen each other since last year. Ha, 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 ha. Well, thanks for coming. It's a good way to kick off the year. I'm excited about this year, which is kind of rare for me. Um, I like to think about the worst case scenario a lot, but I'm feeling pretty hopeful about this year. Um, and look what washed up. <laughs> yeah. Um, in case you don't know, this is Joel Fritz. He um, was on staff here for 100 years or so, um, for a long time, and uh, is, is also my cousin, but um, that's like secret information. Um, but then about eight months ago, he and his family took an assignment from the Lord to go to Manfredonia, Italy, which is, there's a reason it's not a tourist destination, but uh, it's a different part of Italy. But he went there with his family to go uh, strengthen churches and, and spread the word of God and, and work with the church planner there. And, and so he's back, but he's going to give us a little report on what's going on, and then we'll jump into the message. Buongiorno, living <laughs> streams. But if you've spent any time in Italy, you know that buongiorno means good morning, but it's more formal. And what friends say to friends is ciao. So ciao, everyone. I love it, living stream. <laughs> It's really good to be back. Uh, you notice my wife, Kristen, is not with me. Uh, she would love to be here. She brings light and joy into every room she steps into. But she's with her father, who's battling cancer uh, in Alabama right now. And that's where she should be, right? So I've got to give uh, our greetings to all of you right now, myself. Um, and there's just so many different things that I'd love to share with you. I honestly would love to take an hour and just tell you all these stories, some funny, some sad that we've experienced over these past uh, seven months in Italy. But I don't have time for that. And so I had to pick just a little something to share with you. And really, uh, what that little something is, is just this uh, unbelievable experience that my family and I have had in getting to step out, but realizing that when you step out and you face the challenges that come with stepping out of uh, security, comfort, things like that, things that are known into the unknown, that the Lord rises with his grace to meet the challenges that you face. And it has been so wonderful for us. So I'm just going to give you like a very short recap of the things, some of the challenges we've been through. When we first got to Italy, we didn't have a place to stay, and so we were kind of staying in Airbnbs and places we could find. And we were asking uh, the people on our email list to pray for us, and you guys were praying for us to find a place, but it took more than two months to find a place for us. And I'm glad we said no to some of the places that we said no to. One of them was uh, in a, an apartment on the third or fourth floor, and it had a bell tower, I promise you, as close as this wall is to us right here. And that bell tower would ring three times in the early morning, and we were still like, okay, Jesus, is th if this is what you have, we can do this, you know? And finally, I had the, the confidence that the Lord had something better, and I said, no, we're out of here. And so the Lord has provided us a place, and it's wonderful. I mean, we look for a car. One of the funny things is you, if, if you spent any time in Europe, uh, largely from what I gather now, uh, but especially Italy, in August, I was trying to find a car, and I would go to people, and I'm like, sell me a car. And they'd be like, I can't sell you a car. And I'm, what, when are you going to sell me a car? They'd say, come back in September. And I could not understand it for the life of me. And finally, I realized that the entire country of Italy is on vacation in the month of August. And if you think I'm kidding, I am not kidding. They would not sell me a car, and they were all on vacation. And so it was a really interesting experience. Now, I think Italy has actually got something right there. That's not wrong. But, but being an American and trying to find my vehicle and being without a car and having to rent in the high season again and again, I was like, oh, this is killing us. But, uh, gosh, what are the other challenges? This is the thing. Some of the real challenges came after that. Uh, when we got a phone call about a friend who died, it was very sad for us only a few weeks in. And then we got a phone call about a month into our trip uh, where we found out that Kristen's father has stage four cancer. And that was heavy. I mean, you want to talk about feeling the miles between us? Those miles, uh, thousands of miles between here and Manfredonia, Italy. But they felt we, like we could feel every single inch between us. It felt a long ways from where we were supposed to be. And yet we knew that the Lord had orchestrated something, and so we hung in there. Kristen's been back to visit her father. He's doing good for the moment, which has been a really special and wonderful Christmas for us to be able to spend it with him. And we're praying that the Lord wants to provide him healing. It would be wonderful to spend a few more years with him. 
But those are some of the big challenges we face. But the great thing is that the Lord's grace has risen and met those. And so September did come around, and a great Italian friend who speaks very little English helped me go and find a used car. And I bought a cheap used mini minivan. And I call it the mini minivan because it's not really a minivan. You know what a minivan is. This is much smaller. But it's exciting to have a vehicle, so it's getting us around town. Some of our needs are met there. We found a wonderful apartment that has three bedrooms, which means we have an extra bedroom for people who want to come and stay. And it's really provided a wonderful place for us to be able to meet with people. And we've had wonderful times of hosting things like Taco Tuesday, where we introduce Italians to tacos, you know. When you can't speak the language, speak the food, right? (laughs) And Italians love food, and they didn't reject our tacos. They loved them, and it's been a great time. We've been so happy to see the Lord provide those things for us. And I want to say thank you to you all because, my goodness, you have been so faithful in your support and your prayers and finances for us. We have not lacked at all. We have our needs met, and I'm just so thankful. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But I guess something that I really want to hear is I, you to hear as I stand here is just how special this particular community is. When we're in Italy, Kristen and I are generally out on our own. We have a few people, uh, a, little, a little team of six people there. And we're out there and we're seeking to do ministry. And so we spend time every single day with people who don't know Jesus, people who have need, people who have struggles, people who are genuinely hopeless and they don't know what the future holds for them. And we sit down with them and we spend time with them. But what we have learned and what we feel so much is what is missing in that we don't have a place to return to every single weekend like a living streams. The community is not robust and it's not strong there. So what we're seeking to do is take the strength of living streams and take it to Italy and provide some of the love that Jesus Christ has shared with us, some of the support that you guys have shared with us and the encouragement and the prayers. But gosh, you feel just what is missing over there when you come back into a place like this and feel the strength that exists here. And so I have a hope for you and maybe just a little challenge that I want to leave you with, and it's this. Soak it up. Soak it up. Realize that the people that are sitting next to you could be some of the best friends that you will have in your entire life. Realize that there are mentors here and people who want to help you grow in your faith and challenge you to be the best person that you can be, the best person becoming like Jesus that you can be. Realize how much strength this place has and then use every second you can to just allow it to reshape you from the inside out. And then when you experience some of that feeling, of wholeness and health, some of the breakthrough that I know the Lord wants to do in your life, don't forget that there's a world out there that has very, very few places like Living Streams. All right, thanks, Joel. Um, well, I want to pr- pray for Joel and his family, but I, I want to do it a little differently if, if it's okay you guys participate. Um, instead of just me praying in my voice, um, out there, I'd like for us all to pray out loud for him and his family, just to fill this room um, with, with prayers and, and fill the heavens with, with our voice and our petitions for his family. So um, this is Joel Fritz. His wife's name is Kristen, and his, his, uh, his father-in-law's name is David, who's um, fighting stage four cancer. So if you, if you would, I mean, you don't have to. You can pray quiet if you want, but... Um, but I'm just going to kind of give us a ready, set, go. And, uh, and if we could all just really petition the Lord on, on their behalf and, and what they're trying to do with Italy, that would be great. And if you don't, you know, if, if, you, if another language is your um, common language, you could speak in that language. I mean, the Lord can sort it all out. He's real good at, at prayers. Um, so let's do that. Ready, set, go. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this family, and we ask that you would comfort them and you would guide them through these challenges, help them to know your heart and your, your wisdom. Lord, you would strengthen them as they face these challenges, um, as their heart is divided. Lord, I pray that you would just be the Lord of their heart. Um, for Kristen, that you really speak to her, give her confidence of where she's supposed to be and what she's supposed to do. And for David, I pray that you really would bring healing, Lord. You'd bring healing to him and that he would be able to bring healing to others as well. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we lift this family up to you. We thank you that you hear our prayers, and we thank you that you are with them. I pray that they would be more aware of that than ever before in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Now will you stand with me?
And uh, I'm going to read a, pa- a passage of Scripture that hopefully can, uh, can get you ready for a new year. Um, real quick, we, we have a couple things going on 2020. Uh, we, we have Financial Forum coming up this Wednesday. I'm going to host it, which is kind of funny. But, um, but there's going to be a great panel of speakers that we're going to interview and talk about resolutions, regrets, and, and forming a rule of life. Uh, so it should be a good time, free lunch, all of that. And uh, 2020 also is going to be a special year because we don't have to deal with the evil empire of Alabama or New England in any of our championship football games. I don't know if I should say that in church, but... And it's going to be a new year because it's an election year. Hey! We all love election years, right? They're so fun these days. I'm not, I'm not saying anything, okay? Just said the word election year. That's all I say. Um, but as we face um, this new year and all of this, this has been a scripture that's kind <clears> of <throat> got me stirred up a little bit, and particularly the last part. But uh, it says this. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. There are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, living streams, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. And to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. What we're going to do this year is we're going to introduce this concept of spiritual formation, Christian spiritual formation, discipleship, all of this. Um, we're introducing it, not, not that we've created it, <laughs> but we're introducing it as a, as a kind of guide, guidance for our church this year and what we feel like the Lord wants to do. Last year, we really focused on the family as far as our household and the work that needs to be done there, as well as our church as a family and the work that the Lord's doing there. Um, And this year, we're really going to talk about how we can be formed into the image of Christ, the state of our soul, the state of our being, where it is and where it could be or where God wants to lead it to be. And I love this verse, and this verse is so important um, for us to remember as we start to try and, and move forward in our relationship with Christ. It's that that God is able to present us spotless and with great joy before his glorious presence. It's, it's not that we uh, just grit it out and summon all our strength and, and we just try and try and try. I mean, resolutions, they're fine, that's great. But anything that we're trying to do in our own effort alone falls short. I mean, many of you are trying to, like, you know, diet, and many of you are trying to get in better shape, many of you are trying to, you know, do this or that, read more books, whatever. and how's it working for you? Is it working good? Like, you getting everything done you want? No. We, we struggle with falling through, but I love what the scriptures, the, the, the promise that we're given here is that God is able. We should rejoice and be glad and, and worship and praise and rest that God is able. Listen to what he says to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. I mean, how fun will it be to stand before the throne of God and your name's called, come before the throne, David, Joe, Bartholomew, whatever your name is. And you you walk up there and you're going before the very presence of God. And in this moment, you feel spotless. And you feel great joy. That's God's plan for your life. That's the work that Jesus Christ, through the power of his spirit, wants to do in you, no matter where your starting point is. 
So first of all, let's, let's know that it's, it's God who wants to do it. It's God who makes it possible. It's God who fuels it, funds it, you know, gives us all of the energy to do it. It's all him. But then what we're going to learn is what is our part? What can we do in this dance with the Lord as he's trying to get us to this point? So spiritual formation. Um, we're going to pop up some slides here and define some things. This is going to be like a PowerPoint presentation. So if you're a business person, whatever, you're like, oh, this is great. You're speaking my language. The rest of you, sorry, it's going to feel weird. feels weird for me. But spiritual formation is the process. Christian spiritual formation is the process of moving from less Christ-like to more Christ-like. Not complicated. Pretty simple there. Uh, I mean, the process is not simple. But, but the, the idea of what, what God's trying to do is when we give our life to Christ, what he's trying to do is take us from being less Christ-like and causing us to become more Christ-like. And we define being Christ-like as, the next slide, the beautiful heart. We did a whole sermon series on it. You can go back. You can listen to it on podcasts. You can watch it on video, whatever you want to do. But we define the, the beautiful heart, the heart of Christ, as the humble heart, the helpful heart, the grateful heart, and the generous heart. Now, that's a good vision for 2020, right? to grow in those things, to help our kids understand the beauty of this versus all the other things they think are beautiful. The humble heart, the helpful heart, the grateful heart, the generous heart. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the broken heart because that's our starting point. That's what it means to be less like Christ is to have a heart that is broken that God can form into the beautiful heart. So next slide is the stages of the journey. So we're talking about Christian spiritual formation, the process of going from this to this, and there's a journey. Um, we've, we've mentioned the word days and decades. It takes days and decades um, for us to follow Christ and, and, to, and to experience the formation of Christ. And hopefully many of you here today are saying, well, I'm not where I should be, but I'm not where I was. I mean, that is really a wonderful thing to be able to say at the end of any year or season of your life. And that's really what God is trying to do. He's, he's, he's working it out. He's working it out. He's working it out. He's working it out. So there's the stages of the journey. And this is not something that, again, we've come up with. This is over 2,000 years of church history in addition to thousands of years before that of, of kind of a Judaistic approach to the one God. Um, this, is, this is unpacking a lot of that. And, and people have put different terms and, and words to this. But they've understand that there seems to be phases. And it's not necessarily linear phases, even though sometimes it goes that way, but sometimes it's almost like cyclical phases uh, of refining that we go through. But these are some of the phases that are, we, we're walking in darkness, that's, that's a place that we usually begin. If we have an awareness that we're in the dark, but that usually is because we're starting to understand and have an awakening to the light of God, to the, to the presence of God, to, to something that God is bringing into our life, which if we surrender to that, brings us into this stage of purgation. Now that's a fun word, right? No. It's horrible, but it, I love it because it describes that process where God is, is starting to kind of unpack the world in us. And in, and in, and in unpacking the world and, and the flesh and the brokenness, he's starting to, to pull those things out and put in something of his nature, something of his love, something of his kingdom. And it's kind of this process. It's a refining process. It's, it's challenging. It's purification. And so there's this time of that. And, and then there's this season of illumination where all of a sudden now, you know, I, I feel like I, I'm not able to hear the Lord and know the Lord. And, and I, I'm able to see the difference between what is me and fleshy and what is the Lord and his spirit. And it's this process of illumination that we get to. And then ultimately the end result, the goal of it all is this super intimidating word for me, union. When I first heard this, it just shocked me. Because I think it is such a better word than all the words I'd ever come up with. Union with Christ, united with Christ, is the goal of all Christian spiritual formation. Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, I pray that they would be one with me even as I am one with you. Which seems like an audacious, ridiculous prayer to me. But that is God's goal for you. You. You, 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 you. Individually, he wants to be united with you. Now, some of the super holy people that wrote about all of this stuff, they talk about it as spiritual marriage. I'm not going to talk about that because it throws me off. <laughs> it's like, come on, man, let's just do it down. But, that, but, but being united with Christ is the goal. And here's the beauty of it, because I keep thinking, well, if we're really following Christ, then we'll be producing. 
We'll be serving. We'll be sacrificing. We'll be doing all these things. We'll be the Fritzes or whatever. But no, the goal of God in your life is that you'll be united with Christ because Jesus says stuff like this in John 15. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit. So the goal is not bearing much fruit. The, go- the bearing much fruit is the byproduct of our union with Christ. You get me? This is so un-American. This is so much more Eastern or something. It's so hard for us because we are constantly trying to measure up with our accomplishments and achievements. And in the kingdom of heaven, God says, psh, 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 whatever. Union with Christ, being united with Christ. And we're going to spend the next three weeks and more than that, but the next three weeks really looking at the book of Exodus and the life of Moses to try and give pictures to this because this kind of philosophical terminology doesn't do much for me. I need pictures like a little kid. So we're going to do that. So this is a a diagram that we've come up with to try and help us understand the the cyclical formation of this uh, process. Spiritual deformation, spiritual formation. Right now you are being formed one direction or the other by what you take in through your ears, through your eyes, through your experiences, you are being formed one way or another, and you are either leading to Christian spiritual formation or deformation. Um, All of us, before we came to Christ, we were in this cycle of indulgence, which leads to idolatry, which leads to disintegration. Disintegration being our heart loves many other things other than what it was created to love, so it doesn't work quite right. It's confused. It's restless, it's broken. This is the process of disintegration. And you can see this, I mean, basically it's like, America, what? (laughs) You know, indulgence, idolatry, disintegration. We're just on this constant cycle. And I'm praying for election year revival. I really think, man, we're at this point where where, where it's going to turn one way or another in some ways. But there's there's no reason that America can't turn back and turn into what the Lord, we can have our own spiritual awakening as a nation. Hallelujah. You don't believe it. I'm struggling too, but let's keep praying for it. All right? But then somewhere in in that process, many of us here have been interrupted, disrupted by something outside of ourselves, even outside of creation. Something of God has broken into our scene. The light, the love, of Christ has come in. The voice of God has spoken to us. For some of us, there's lots of little moments of awakening that lead to this big surrender. For Saul, remember Saul in the Bible on the way to Damascus, there was this big abrupt smack in the face. Bam! All right. The light of God showed up and he surrendered to Christ and began to go into the process of spiritual formation. For Joel, it's funny. I know Joel. I don't, he's not in here anymore, but... Um, He's my cousin, so I grew up with him. And, and he describes his, his conversion to Christ or his moment of awakening as the moment of surrender because he, said he had lots of moments of awakening where God was coming and kind of calling to him and drawing and calling it to him. But he was like, that's not fun. That's not cool. I want to go this way. And he just kept going fake ID to fake ID to fake ID to fake ID was kind of what he was doing. But then literally his big moment of truth was when he took his fake ID and he tore it up. And he's like, okay, God. I'm going to go your way. And he started following Christ and going through this process. Surrender is a big part of that awakening. Um, But that moment of awakening leads to this this formation of purgation and illumination, which ultimately leads to union. And we'll describe more of that as we go on. You tracking with me? Yeah? You want to sign this contract? You know, businessman, sorry. Horrible joke, but um, trying to sell you something right now. All right, so the next slide is spiritual practices. So people who have been... um, Paying attention to all these years of church history, been paying attention to what the Bible teaches, um, but paying attention to their own lives, have have written and and discovered there are certain things, spiritual disciplines, spiritual practices, um, there are certain things that we can do as believers that will help us progress down the road of spiritual formation. Now, These are not, you know, rub the genie, get what you want type things. There's no guarantee that you're going to do one of these things and bah, you get what you want. God doesn't work like that. But there are practices that have been proven to be helpful. 
And, and what's interesting is you might find some of these are helpful for you and some of these are not, whereas maybe your spouse, some of them are helpful for her and some of them are not for her. And so you kind of try and find what are the spiritual practices in your own life with your personality, with your job, with your family, with your you know, illness or not, illness, whatever it might be. What are some spiritual practices that help you? And what we're going to do as a, as, a, as a church is we're going to really kind of dive into this and begin to discover these things. And we're going to actually, in the month of January, practice some of these things specifically. Um, and we'll get to that in just a second. But our hope is that maybe you'll grab a couple of these and be like, wow, when I do these things, I seem to progress. I, I seem to strengthen I seem to hear God's voice a little better, a little clearer. And so then when you go through the seasons of your life where they're, they're, your marriage is really struggling or one of your kids is totally crazy or you're having a real hard time or a dark night of the soul or something happened, you'll have a couple of these practices that you can run to and say, okay, God, God I'm going to do this. Meet me here again. And it's really helpful in those times to have those. Journaling is a huge thing for me. It's a huge part of my walk with Christ. And it's so embarrassing because I sound like a girl, like I'm writing in my diary all the time. But it's true. I'm not a girl, but I journal all the time. <laughs> so anyway, spiritual practices that can help. Some of these we're going to kind of, these are just some quick examples. We'll fill these lists out. But the fast life or slow life, we need to cultivate this. This is abstaining um, from food, from vision for social media for music in your car whatever it might be for seasons of your life so you can draw close to the Lord the grounded life or grow is you start a Bible reading program memorize scripture read a Christian book spiritual promotion um, schedule appointments with a spiritual mentor or a Christian therapist something like that because you're just wanting to, to grow or the giving generous life is serve someone in need give gifts to people in need share your faith or just take your family and move to Manfredonia for a year ways that you're saying I'm just gonna just give out and in, 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 do, in doing that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope the Lord will respond with drawing us closer, filling our tank, whatever it might be. And that's what Joel's been able to share, even though they're going through tough times. So those are practices for January, specifically. Okay. I'm a pastor. I might be your pastor. I don't know. You could call me whatever you want. You call me that guy. That guy up there. Whatever you want to call me, that's fine. But I'm asking you with summoning all the authority I can into me and saying, please, Participate with us on this. In January, we want you to join us on Sundays. You're already doing great. Great job, everybody. And in your life groups, if you don't have a life group, we'll be launching some more in February, so hold up for that. Um, and, and then on Wednesdays, we want you to fast from food, breakfast and lunch, and snacks if you need me to get technical. Fast from food and join us at 7 o'clock for a prayer meeting. A full-on prayer meeting where you're going to pray out loud in front of other people probably. In groups, by yourself, whatever. I don't know. But we're just, we're going to pray. It's not going to be a church service like this. It's going to be a prayer service. And uh, we're going to pray. We are going to provide food for, at 6 o'clock. Some soup for, at 6 o'clock for anybody who needs to eat before they pray because they're too angry to pray. And for families and all that. It just works out convenient. So we can have a little fellowship too. But, but the main thing is no food on Wednesdays. Three Wednesdays. That's all we're asking for. And then 7 o'clock, we're all going to pray together in here, super hungry or soupy, whatever it might be. And we're going to pray and seek the Lord for 2020 and for each other and all of that. You ready? You with that? All right. Um, and then the last thing is we want everyone to commit to uh, one thing in each of those categories for 21 days. Now you're like, you're crazy. No, it's just 21 days starting next Sunday. We gave you a little thingy right here. Um, so you can choose one of these. Or you can write something in if you have better ideas than us. That's cool. We're totally comfortable with that. Um, but for 21 days, we really want to try and, and just kind of set ourselves differently as we're going into this year with the hope that God will speak, God will guide, God will fill our tanks so that we can go through 2020 kind of in all of that. And we're probably going to need to reset a couple times throughout the year. That's fine. But we want to start out that way as well. So can you please join us even though you're like, oh, you know, I'm real busy all the time. That's fine. But just maybe for three Wednesdays, can you join us? I mean, our, our, our house is supposed to be a house of prayer. That's what Jesus, Jesus taught us. And, and to some extent, I think we're going to be measured more on our prayer time attendance than we are on anything else of whether we're doing a good job. This is important for us to gather together and pray together as a family. 
And so please, I mean, if you were here first service on a Christmas Eve service, there was a thousand people in here and about a hundred of you. I'm so sorry. I know it was miserable for you. But this is fasting and prayer time. So if there's a thousand people in here, we're all miserable. It's better. It's like where we're supposed to be. Miserable, right? No. All right. So check it out. We'll fill it up. We'll do whatever we got to do. Um, Wednesday, January 15th, right? That's the first one. Yeah. It's going to be great. It's going to be good. Okay, so those are our slides. Now I want to focus in real quick as we kind of bring this message um, to a little bit uh, more to us. I want to focus on the broken heart. The broken heart, which was one of those slides we popped up because that's where our starting point. That's where we're beginning. Um, for those of us who are honest, even if we had a great 2019, we're still starting this year with a broken heart. A broken heart, a heart that we can't quite understand, a heart that goes places we don't want it to go, a heart that isn't there when we need it to be there in love and strength. And so we define the broken heart with a few words. It's a fallen heart. And what I mean by that is what the Bible teaches. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Before you ever did anything, the Bible teaches your heart was fallen. It was broken. It was bent towards sin. You didn't teach your kids how to sin, did you? If you did, that's horrible. You didn't teach your kids to say the word mine, did you? But they all figured it out. Mine. 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 You know that? Whoa. Where did that come from, man? I'm going to change my bedtime stories. Whatever it might be. You don't teach them, but it's there. They are born in that way with a fallen heart. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So if you thought that was you, sorry to burst your bubble this morning. And women, you are included in there, okay? It says men, and you know that's true. You're like, amen, but you, women are in there too. Isaiah 64.6 all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are a filthy garment. Even if we try really hard to get our act cleaned up, even if we're trying to do good things, even for God potentially, the truth is, is they're all filthy garments. That was one of the things that God had so much trouble with the people of Israel because they were doing so many good things, but out of a dirty heart, which made it all dirty. And then in 1 John 1, 1.8, it says, If we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. A little bit of honesty time as we begin 2020. The truth is we have a fallen heart. We have a heart that is bent towards things away from God. All of us do. And not only do we have a fallen heart, but we have a deceitful heart. Just like 1 John says, our heart likes to deceive us and trick us. Jeremiah 17 goes a little bit heavier. He says, the heart is hopefully dark and deceitful. A puzzle that no one can figure out. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are, not as who they pretend to be. Because we have this awareness of our deceitful heart, of our fallen heart, we spend all of our lives trying to dress it up. We come up with all kinds of facades, all kinds of disguises, all kinds of fronts that we project because we don't want anyone to really know the true state of our heart. And that's true for all of us. It's true for me. If you guys knew the stuff that went through my mind and through my heart, you would go to a different church. And I would join you somehow. But then, I, then you'd have to go to a different church again. <laughs> but then I would too. And maybe we would end up at the same one and then we'd have to go. But maybe you'd get lucky and go somewhere where I wasn't there. But then if I knew the stuff in your heart, then it would... See what I'm saying? <laughs> honest, honest, honest. It's a deceitful, fallen heart. Um, Augustine, this guy who wrote in, in that, you know, about the 300, 400 century um, after Christ, he, uh, he was a great Christian thinker, and he's been really even formative even today for a lot of um, Christian philosophy and, and theology. But he wrote something called the Confessions, and in it he describes the restless heart. And, 
And he described his heart as, as one, you know, at one point his heart was so restless because he didn't know who he was, where he came from, or what he was supposed to do. And you might be coming into 2020 feeling that. Like, I don't really know who I am or what I'm supposed to do. And it, there's this anxiety, there's this restlessness that stirs up within you. And then he talked about another part, aspect of the restless heart where once you say, okay, I feel like I know who I am, I know what I want, and I know what I'm hoping for, and then you get that, and it's like, yes, you know, and then there's like a week of yes, and then there's like another four days of yes, and then there's like, oh no, the restlessness is coming again. The, that same, uh, that, that ache, that restlessness begins to kind of sh- surface again. And you're like, no. No, no, the very thing I thought would answer this, the new job, the house, the, the girl, the, the whatever it might be, hasn't actually done anything. It's just kind of scratched the itch, but now it's even stronger. And that's a real challenge. I mean, that's America right there. It's like, keep scratching the itch. <laughs> you know, never stop scratching the itch. Instead of seeing that maybe there's, there's an itch that can't be scratched by the things in this life and in this world. And then the last restlessness he talks about is the restlessness of a Christian who's in this process of spiritual formation. And this restlessness comes from the fact that you know who you are, you know where you're going, but you know there's a lot of miles between here and there. And, and you're okay with that. And you understand that, but but it's still a restlessness because you long to be at that point where you're with Christ, you're united with Christ, where, when our faith becomes sight and our union becomes easy. There isn't a gravity of this world pulling us out of that union all the time that we're resisting. We are just united with Christ. I mean, that's, that's our longing. And, but yet we know that we're not there. We're in this process of on the way there, yet we know we can't control when we get there. That lies in the hands of God the Father who will send his son at the time appointed to bring times of refreshing. And so there's this restlessness that comes from that. But that's a restlessness that that the peace of Christ, Christ satisfies and a restlessness that's also filled with hope and a restlessness that's hopefully supposed to make us do like those Fritzes and and say, hey, I want to go find the people who are restless in those other categories and share with them the love and hope of Christ so they can move out of that into a restlessness that actually has peace mingled with it. That's our hope. And lastly, the the heart that is broken and fallen and and, uh, deceitful and restless, it has these unwanted longings, unwanted desires, where we know that there's infiltration coming from outside, but what's so bizarre is every once in a while, your own heart within you will start to want something that you know is out of line. And yet, for some reason, you can't just stop it from wanting that. It's because we have broken hearts. It's because we have broken hearts. And yet what awakening does, awakening brings us to this point where we can now be awakened in Christ. We can receive the life of Christ. And what the Bible teaches is that when that moment happens, when we surrender our broken heart to God, He fixes it. And the way that He fixes it is interesting. He puts a new heart within it. And, and this is where it's tricky because the way the Bible describes it, it's almost like we have both hearts now. I heard someone talking about like a kidney transplant. Um, and in a kidney transplant, they leave the old kidney in there. And they just put a new, new one in there and they wire it all up, but they don't go bother to take the old kidney out. <gasps> it's crazy. And that's a little bit like what goes on with us is, is, is the Lord puts this new heart in us, but we still have that old heart. So then there's kind of this little battle going on. This battle's going on within us. And, and the way the Bible talks it, it's the spirit versus the flesh. You know, when I'm talking to kids, I'm usually like the good dog and the bad dog. <laughs> if you feed the good dog, it gets stronger. You feed the bad dog, it gets stronger. You don't feed the bad dog, it gets weaker. Feed the good dog, it gets stronger. Hey, we're doing better. It's a little bit of what spiritual formation is and spiritual practices. It's trying to form and grow and strengthen the spirit within us, that new heart that God has given us. So that it can become strong and healthy and vibrant. 
And that's what spiritual formation is all about. That's what we're going to be partaking in, participating in. That's what you have to figure out on your own, but we're collectively going to try and figure it out together so that you can figure it out on your own. Well, we all start with this broken heart. Um, but I love this. this is, I just want to kind of wrap up with this. This is, this is so comforting to me when I think through the challenge of all of these things. There's two things I want to read to you as we, as we wrap up. The first is um, something from um, a lady named Celia Corey who's writing about um, St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. This is, this is intense. Some of you are going to love this. Some of you are going to be like, I never want to hear that again because it's just very wordy. But it says, A major conceptual dynamic in all religious traditions is the need for purification and transformation of an individual in order to affect integration and maturation of the personality in the divine. <laughs> it's just fancy ways of saying what we just said. Although the means by which this perf purification takes place differs according to the cultural and religious configurations of any given tradition, nevertheless a reoccurring image of that of an inner and outer odyssey is necessary. A major example is the threefold path of John of the Cross, which is what we have with purgation, illumination, and um, union, which, pre or which presents a psycho-spiritual journey by which divine osmosis can be realized passing through the dark night of the soul and culminating in spiritual marriage. Although not accepted by many theoreticians or practitioners of mysticism, nevertheless the value of the San Juanes schemata still holds sway in contemporary society. You guys feel better? No? Let me say a lot of that in a scripture way. <laughs> This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, a veil is taken away between them and God. Now where the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we are transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory that comes from Him who is the Spirit. Basically, the way Paul was writing that someone later tried to sum up in a very, you know, kind of psychological way was that the process of how we are formed, it isn't about human effort. It's not about all these challenges. It's not about getting things right here and there. It's simply about contemplating the face of Jesus. It's trying to find a way to quiet the noise around us To quiet our minds within us. You know, the world is full of noise. No doubt about it. With our phones dinging, with the TV on, with the stuff on the radio, with other people. There's just constant noise. And it's not neither good or bad. I'm not making a judgment on that. It's just so full of noise. And we've got to find times of quiet to hear the still, small voice of God. And not only that, but our own minds. We in America have really started to, to believe that we can work as hard as we want for as long as we want and then just shut it off and sleep anytime we want. When, when that doesn't work for us, we still work just as hard and, and just as long, but then we take some medicine or a little wine or something to try and quiet our minds to sleep. And that might work for a little while, but still, once that stops working, we, stop, we, we never go back to the amount of work and the way that we're using our minds in a way that is beyond what it was supposed to be meant for, trying to ever scratch the itch and gain more wealth and gain more position and gain more whatever. We run right through Sabbaths, whatever it might be, and we can't figure out why our mind won't shut off when we need it to shut off. Because we've spun it out of control. So we not only have to quiet the world around us, but we have to figure out how to quiet our own minds. To find a rhythm and a pace of life that changes depending on how old or young you might be so that our minds can actually be healthy enough to once again rest and hear the still small voice of the Lord. And then our hearts. Our hearts are crazy too. But we have to find a way to kind of get into a place where we can actually sit and contemplate the face of Jesus. Jesus did the work to remove the veil. 
He died on a cross. He paid the price for our sins so that the veil between us and God could be torn forevermore. So that now there is nothing that separates us from the very presence and freedom and light and beauty of Christ's presence. Yet for some reason when we get there, our minds are so spun out, our worlds are so busy that we still can't really receive what he has for us. And so the first step is to acknowledge our broken heart and to acknowledge the busyness around us and to realize that the whole goal of Christian formation is to be more like Christ. And the only way we're going to be more like Christ is if we can spend time contemplating the face of Christ. So that's what we're going for. That's a good starting point. That's a good starting point. And then always, as Jude taught us, remember that it's the work of God to make us spotless and full of joy before his presence. So don't feel some sort of legalistic burden laid on you right now. Feel the hope that if you'll find time to carve out, time to contemplate the face of Jesus, he's torn the veil through his blood and sacrifice on the cross. He's the one that's taken on the responsibility to make sure when you show up, he's got guidance for you. All you got to do is figure out how to show up and not show up so burnt out and fried and busy and loud that you can actually receive his still small voice. That's what we're going for. Let's pray. Let's do that right now, actually. This is a good place. Heaven and earth, the space between them feels a little thin in here most of the time. I hope you feel that. And let's just bow our heads and quiet our hearts. God, I ask that you would help quiet our minds, even us that... Our minds just spin and run and have a hard time being still. I pray that by your spirit, by the power of your spirit, Lord, you would bring a holy silence, a holy stillness in this place. We just want you, Jesus. And in this place, really I just want you to think about your heart. And if any of those descriptions of the broken heart really resonated. If you're being honest. And if you're able, if you're willing, just in a whisper, you can say, God, I want to give you my heart. As we start this year of 2020, you've still got breath in my lungs. I just want to give you my broken heart that you might begin to form it in the way that you see fit. I think about when my kids, when something of my kids that they care about breaks, they don't try and fix it. They run to me and they put it in my hands. And I think this is a good moment to run to your Father in heaven and put your heart in his hands. Because he'll take it and he really knows how to fix it. He's the one that made it in the first place. Lord, we do give you our hearts this morning. We pray that you would take and you would form them, transform them, Lord. And help us learn how to quiet ourselves before you in a very loud world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you guys stand with me? We're just going to close with a simple chorus. Just once again, surrendering to the Lord. And if you need prayer for anything, we'll have, we'll have some people up here that would love to pray for you. If you 
got some sickness in your body or a challenging relationship or just some uncertainty about the future, whatever it might be, they'd love to pray for you and, and uh, see what the Lord might speak to you in this place. But I'm excited about a new year. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to come back next week, bring some people. We're going on a journey, and it's going to be good. It's going to be good.